Okay, I'm going to go live here in just a minute. We are live already. All right, we're gonna just wait a few moments for all of our friends and attendees to jump on. And then we will start in just a few minutes here. Get comfortable. This is going to be a great, great presentation. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Sheila Thomas, and I am the Development Manager at the San Diego History Center. And I just wanna welcome everybody tonight to our 2021 um, cohort and um, program in uh, collaboration with Mesa College's Fashion Program for Fashion Redux. We are in our 10th year now in 2021, and we are so glad to be back um, with all of you. And I just wanna say welcome to uh, all of our members, our donors, our board of trustees, and thank everybody for supporting us. It has definitely been a long year, um, but we welcome everybody back. And in fact, today was an exciting day as we welcomed the public back into our physical space in Balboa Park at the San Diego History Center. Um, it was a glorious day and being able to say hello to many of you I see that have joined us here. Um, and I want to let everybody know as well that we all we will be opening the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park starting tomorrow um, and Sunday. So please come on down to uh, Balboa Park and visit us at the museum uh, or the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park. Um, I would like to also invite all of you who are not members of the San Diego History Center to join us and um, get to know us a little bit better. There is information on our website. I'll be posting a lot of this information in the chat function. Um, I know all of you did not join tonight to hear me talk. You wanna hear all of our fabulous designers present and show off their um, amazing, amazing creation. So uh, we're gonna get to that in just a moment. Um, before we do that, I want to show you quickly um, on our website, if you're not able to join us at the museum, which I do want to point out that the, um, the pieces are not in display just yet, but we'll have some information on that later. Um, but what you can do is visit us online and you'll be able to see a, a web version of what we will be having on physical display at the History Center. So here we go. I'm going to do a little just show you quickly. If you go to our website, which is sandiegohistorycenter.org, this will be the landing page. You'll come right over here to exhibitions. 
And you're going to be able to, if you go to current exhibitions, you'll be able to see what we have currently right now. Right now, and actually opening today for the first time at the History Center, we have Nathan Harrison, born enslaved, died a San Diego, San Diego legend. Um, this is done in conjunction and partnership with San Diego State. Um, and it will, this is a fabulous, fabulous exhibit we've been working on for a couple years now um, about the first black homesteader in San Diego. Um, and our complimentary exhibit to that as well uh, is Celebrate San Diego, which is San Diego's Black History and Heritage. Um, two dynamic uh, exhibits that I invite all of you to come down and see. And our third exhibit that is brand new and opening to the public is revealed. And it's the San Diego, it, it's uh, a very small portion of what we have available at the San Diego History's Fine Art Collection. So we would love for you all to come down and view that. So we're gonna go right over here to Fashion Redux. We'll click on that. And you're going to be able to view all of these. Um, first, these are the um, inspiration pieces that are pieces that are a part of the History Center's um, collection. And then you keep scrolling and you'll be able to see the student garments. And then if you click on each one, we'll click on you one, you'll be able to see and learn more about each designer and view their pieces a little bit more up close, find their statements um, and view their sketches there. The last thing I wanna mention before we start is that we will be having a, um, having a contest for the People's Choice Award. And I invite everybody to vote. What you're gonna do is go down to the polling button at the bottom of your screen there, click on the poll, and then you can vote for your favorite designer. So I encourage all of you to do that as well as we will be announcing that at the end of the program. So without any further ado, I wanna say welcome to our panelists. We've got Leilani alentaga Kathness and Jeremy uh, Prince, who are collection specialists at the San Diego History Center. We have Jordan Smiley, who is the assistant professor of fashion. We also have our fabulous designers, Ramses, Ellie, Melanie, and Ye Wan. And right now I'm gonna turn it right on over to Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. So just a little background on what exactly Fashion Redux is for those of you who aren't as familiar with it. As Sheila said, this is our 10th year collaborating with the San Diego History Center. So we are super excited about that. Um, what we do is uh, we basically pick a theme or a decade or some sort of unifying concept. And then I meet with the um, collection specialists and they pull garments from their collection that fall within that category or theme or decade. And then the students actually get to see those garments up close and personal. Although this year with COVID, we had a challenge. So we did it via Zoom, but everybody was wonderful. Leilani was amazing. She was like, okay, over here, camera over here, over here and turning everything. It was incredible. The students did not miss a beat. They got everything, all the pictures they needed. So after looking at those garments, then the students go back to their sketchbooks and they redesign um, a brand new garment based on what they saw. They use the historical garments as inspiration and then they come up with a redux or a redo version of the historical sources. And so what you're going to see tonight are their resulting garments and as well as the original pieces. We will show you both. So before we get into that though, I am going to share just a little bit about our theme, which this year is uniforms. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uniforms and how they interact with fashion and how fashion interacts with uniforms. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Great, can everybody see my screen? Excellent, all right. So in uniforms, Basically, we usually first think of military, right? Because of all the insignia, it's really a good visual indicator of one's function in society. Um, you can tell their rank, their regiment, their country, but honestly, uniforms go way beyond military. They're found in sports, in medicine, in schools, in retail service areas. 
The point is that the uniform basically organizes everyone who wears it so that they look the same except for their shape and size and face. And what this does is basically makes the wearer part of a set team or aligned to a specific brand. So corporate clothing can be used for this productivity as well. So where did uniforms come from? Well, the first uniforms can be traced back to the Middle Ages, and these were found among livery. And these were items of clothing that were covered with colors, house seals, and crests, all relating to the families that those people served. And they were used most extensively in England during the War of the Roses. The livery coats were often provided by the lords to their contracted soldiers. And then as you can see through these pictures here, um, this tradition continued throughout the 18th and the 19th century. Um, so you can see the beef eaters in their elaborate red garments. And then as well picked up in, this is from Downton Abbey, but it is representative of what actually happened. Uh, the footmen and the servers would actually wear garb that would associate them with the house that they served. And it was seen as a privilege, an honor. So uniforms continued to be used in the military with details identifying the wearer's side, rank, and position, but uniforms also began to spread to both public and private institutions as time went on, such as schools, hospitals, and prisons. They continued to create an image of unity and authority, but they also began to be used as a means of regulating and controlling who wore them as well. So as I've said, uniforms and fashion have a very symbiotic relationship. And I'm just gonna read this quote real quickly because I think it's pretty spot on. The relationship between fashion and uniforms is symbiotic and each requires the other to function. Fashion needs uniforms to be a source of inspiration as it cycles through trends, but uniforms also need fashion, creating practical yet attractive garments by borrowing from the rapidly changing trends. And you will see examples of this as I go through. So uniforms often gave us timeless classics. So everything from pea coats to bomber jackets, crew neck t-shirts, cargo pants, and even combat boots. These were all originated in the military, but they have become some of fashion's most iconic garments as time has gone on. Fashion also looks to uniforms often and reinterprets them in designing new looks, uses them as inspiration. As you can see here on the far left, this is an image of British officers from the 19th century. Um, and then in the 60s, the Yves Saint Laurent collection, the Saharian style redesigned those jackets worn by the soldiers. And then in 2015, Mark Jacobs went back to the same inspiration and redesigned that for his collection as well. Here's another example. You might recognize these shirts on the left as the striped white and blue shirts from the French Navy. And these were used in Jean-Paul Gaultier's ensemble, as you can see in the male's garment on the left. And then also in the Sakai ensemble in 2015 on the right in the dress. And more uniforms here. The ones on the left are from the 50s and the 40s. They are Army and Navy Reserve uniforms. And the one in the middle is a Chanel suit from the 60s. And then on the far right, we see Kate Middleton wearing Alexander McQueen. So you can clearly see the strong correlation between the uniforms with the silhouette, the colors, the detailing. It's really quite inspiring to the designers who choose to use them. And it even extends to sports, as you can see here with both an evening dress and a casual jersey dress that have been inspired by sports jerseys from the 1930s. It goes on to actually be inspired by modern uniforms such as school uniforms. You can see looks here from Dior, Gucci, and Chanel. And these were all taken from their inspiration of school uniforms. The one on the far right, you might recognize from the movie, The Devil Wears Prada. And this was actually a Chanel jacket that was designed for the movie and worn by Anne Hathaway's character. And this prompted a bunch of new trends in blazers. So the flip side of this, uniforms also turn to fashion. Um, it's pretty common that uh, corporate worlds tend to reach out to fashion designers to get their input in designing their uniforms for their workers. 
Here we can see some McDonald's uniforms from the 70s that are designed by Stan Herman. And airline uniforms. This has happened throughout history. Uh, I just want to point out this one detail real quick because I think it's super fun. This is a TWA uniform from the 1940s. And this was designed by Hollywood costume designer Howard Greer. And what it was known for was this little cutout panel on the shoulder. And it was designed so that this little panel could be unbuttoned and then folded back over to hide the TWA when they were off duty and they wanted to not be identified as easily. So it's kind of a little clever detail that they got there. So Girl Scout uniforms. Yes, Girl Scouts have collaborated with designers throughout time. Most recently, we have Diane von Furstenberg doing the scarf and the clutch. And then really recently, actually in 2020, they collaborated with students at the Fashion Institute of Technology and redesigned the Girl Scout uniforms to have drawstring joggers, hoodies, cargo pants, even a hidden cell phone pocket in the new sash. So they're really trying to make it more appealing to the modern girls now. And even in fast food uniforms now, they're continued to be redesigned. They've gotten new looks from a, a designer here, Warrior Boswell, who actually used to be a McDonald's employee. So he says he knew what they wanted, was ready to design for them, which is pretty cool. And then the London 2012 Olympic uniforms. These were designed, the opening ceremony ones on the left by Ralph Lauren, and the ones on the right were by Stella McCartney. And so the trend continues today with both fashion and uniforms pulling inspiration from each other. And just a little quick preview of things that have happened over the last year. These are inspirations from fast food, from military, sports, et cetera. And you can see the designers' names down at the bottom there. You've got Moschino, Miu Miu, Max Mara, and Tommy Jeans. And so that just gives you a little taste of what uniforms and fashion can bring to each other. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Sheila and we are going to introduce you to the designers and then we're going to get started asking them questions and they will show you their own work. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. We're going back to Leilani first. I apologize. Yes, yes. thank you so much, Jordan. Um, yes, we are very excited to get to the designers, but first we <laughs> would love to showcase to you just exactly what the designers um, were inspired by this year and they were um, pieces from the San Diego History Center collection. And I uh, would love to introduce you all to Jeremy Prince and Leilani Alentaga Kakeness, who are our collection specialists at the San Diego History Center. Take it away. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Sheila. I will begin my presentation. Alrighty. Can you guys see that okay? Great. Okay, so um, I will talk a little bit first about the historic clothing collection at the History Center, um, which is here in this slide. Some a few of the pictures that um, we've taken of the artifacts. So um, the historic clothing collection is made up of 6,000 individual pieces. And the entire collection illustrates 250 years of fashion and design. So um, the men's and women's uniforms in the collection and costumes actually make up a very important part of the collection, especially with the military presence in San Diego. Um, the collection also consists of women's, men's, and children's American, European, and Mexican garments from the 19th to the 21st century. And the gar all of the garments in the collection were either worn by someone from San Diego or belonged to someone who resided in the region. So there is that connection to San Diego with literally every garment. It's, it's amazing. Um, Several local designers are featured in the collection as well as major fashion houses, many of the ones that um, Jordan mentioned. And there are also 175 pairs of shoes and hundreds of accessories from the mid 18th century to the late 20th century. So that's probably um, the oldest part of the collection. Um, and here we have several examples across the centuries. Um, oops, sorry. 
So this is a little bit of repetition from um, Jordan's uh, bit about uniforms, but quite literally it is a tool used by large organizations to resolve issues of uniformity, literally uniforms. Um, I wanted to provide just a little bit of a little bit more information about sort of the sociological aspects of uniforms. Um, so they can be used also to provide boundaries, assure members will conform to institutional goals and eliminate conflict. Um, uniform ser uniforms serve other functions such as serving as a totem or a symbol. They highlight or conceal statuses and they certify legitimacy and suppress individuality in, in several cases. Um, obviously, when applied to fashion, those rules are kind of blown out of the water. And you have, you have examples, I think you had mentioned John Galliano, and you can see the resemblance in uh, the ZLAC uniform and Navy uniforms or something so recent, which is awesome. Um, so I'll start with our ZLAC uniform. It's, uh, it was made in approximately 1895, and it is the uniform that was used by the oldest women's rowing club in the world. Um, so that rowing club is from San Diego, and it was established in 1892, and they have actually produced Olympians and world champions, and their headquarters are on the San Diego Bay. The word ZLAC, or the acronym, stands for the names of the three sisters and the best friend who established or founded the club. And it was inspired by uh, a, men's, a man's Navy uniform, although they obviously adapted it um, to sort of adhere to social decorum of the period for women. And it was donated in 1989 by the ZLAC Growing Club, this uniform here on the left, and uh, along with ephemera and a barge as well. So um, I have here just a, an example of a men's uniform. And you can see the, um, the three stripes. You can see the cuffs are very similar. Um, this is the one from there. And um, the other uniform that was used for another one of the four, excuse me, uniforms that were used for Fashion Redux 2021 was a Girl Scouts uniform that is from circa 1919. Um, the Girl Scouts were founded in 1912 by Juliet Lowe. She's actually um, the far right figure in the image I have here. Um, and the Girl Scouts were founded, like I said, in the progressive era, actually before women had the right to vote. So they were quite forward thinking and sort of in, in sort of that movement. Um, there is an emphasis on inclusiveness, the outdoors, self-reliance and service. And uh, this uh, particular uniform is part of an archive that was donated to the San Diego History Center from the San Diego um, Imperial County Girl Scouts. And there's over 250 uniforms. So um, it's probably one of the best collections of, of Girl Scout uniforms, probably on the West Coast. So this particular uniform was donated to them by a Lieutenant Girl Scout. So, and here we have the Navy uh, Nurse Corps uniform. So this one is um, circa 1940. The Nurse Corps was established in 1901 at the start, and at the start of World War II, there were only approximately 700 nurses in the Nurse Corps. That's the period this uniform is from. And by the end of World War II, there were 11,000 nurses. Um, and in 1944, the Nurse Corps nurses received military ranks, which is something they were really advocating for. Um, and in 1955, they stopped being all female. Um, this particular uniform we received in 1981 and it was worn by the donor um, during her service in San Diego, so. Alrighty, oh, I forgot I had this. Um, and this is an advertisement that was used to attract new recruits to the nurse corps. There was a huge need and once uh, nurses were sort of formally allowed to have ranks in the military or in the Navy, um, more people wanted to join, so. And this is the Knights of Columbus jacket. So this is from the late 19th or the early 20th century. And um, it was, the, the Knights of Columbus were founded in 1882. And the San Diego chapter focuses, well, actually all of them focus on Catholic faith-based charitable efforts and they, contributed quite a bit to various causes worldwide. And they have several million members. 
Um, the interesting thing about um, the Knights of Columbus, which I felt was very topical with our, our theme for the night, um, is that there's been an ongoing effort to revitalize um, the ceremonial regalia to attract new members. So they, um, they recently published that there was a huge um, sort of, they, they don't have as many members every year joining. Um, and so one of the main concerns was how formal and how militaristic and how religious the symbols were on, um, on the uniforms. And so there's a huge effort to kind of scale it back and have less formal regalia to attract new members. So it's interesting. Um, uh, JFK was, is their most famous member. And um, this uniform in particular uh, was donated by Ankara of La Jolla and it was um, worn by a resident um, in the 20th century. So um, that concludes my section. And now I will turn it over to Jeremy who will talk a little bit about the next steps after our virtual event. Perfect. Thank you, Leilani, and thank you, Jordan, and uh, everyone for joining us this evening. So normally what we would do, um, and this is what we attempted to do last year, right before COVID lockdowns uh, came in, but we would have the students bring in their garments and we would put them on mannequins. Uh, and you can see here in the left-hand side that orange dress in the case, and there's a few others. Uh, but we will pair them with the four historical garments from our collection. So we're hoping that uh, all four of the student garments and the inspiration pieces will be in the San Diego History Center from mid-June uh, through the summer. So if you like what you see tonight and you really wanna see all these up close and take in all the amazing details of both the student garments and all the inspiration garments, uh, please check us out this summer. Uh, hopefully there are some e-blasts. So if you're signing up to receive the e-blasts, you'll definitely hear when they are on view this summer. Thank you. Okay, alrighty. Well, uh, that concludes our section of the presentation. Back to you, Sheila. All right. Thank you, Leilani. Thank you, Jeremy. And yes, we invite everybody to come into the San Diego History Center um, anytime now that we're open. And then we will be putting the word out as soon as we have a definitive date on when you can come and see these fabulous garments in person. All right, Jordan, we're going back to you. And it's time for us to meet our designers. Great. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna introduce you guys one by one and you can say a little bit about yourself and then we will just jump right into the questions. So our first designer that we have here is Ramsey Balfaro. Is Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Ramsey Balfaro. I am 20 years old and I was born and raised in Rosarito, Mexico. I'm in my staff from at Mesa College and halfway through the fashion program. Uh, before starting college and even before coming to the US, it was in my hometown where I came upon all of my goals and my passions and where I discovered who I am today and the person that I want to become. I can be happy to represent all that today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ramses. Uh, our next designer is Eli Andrade. Hi everyone, my name is Eli Andrade. Uh, I go by Eli. Um, I was born in Mexico. I'm in the program, the fashion program Mesa for about two years now, I'm almost done, hopefully. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited for this class and I'm, I was excited for this class of draping and for to actually show my designs in the museum. Great, thank you. And our next designer is Melanie Ngo. Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Ngo. Um, I'm a Vietnamese American designer and artist. I've wanted to be a fashion designer since I was little. I used to draw a lot of different designs in my free time and I tried teaching myself how to sew when I was in high school, but it definitely has not been 
the same as the things that I'm learning at the Mesa program now. And it's honestly, it feels like a dream being a part of the Mesa fashion program. Um, outside of fashion, I'm a mixed media artist and a digital illustrator. And my biggest aspiration is to be able to take all of my passions and combine them into one and just share them with the world. And I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to be a part of this Fashion Redux this year. Thank you, Melanie. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Yewon Shin. Hi everyone, my name is Yewon and I was born in Korea. I have, I have been interested in fashion since I was very young because my grandmother was a Hanbok designer, which is Korean traditional garments. So I have seen her work for a long time and I got interested in the fashion designer. So here I am. <laughs> I became a member of MESA in 19 and I graduated this year and I plan, I want to transfer into other school or going back to Korea and learn how to make some humble from my grandmother and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yewon. All right, so I'm going to start asking the panel some questions. Uh, Melanie, I have the first question for you. So your garment has a lot of details that were very inspired by the uniforms that you saw at the History Center. Can you walk us through the details that you chose to use and why you chose to incorporate them into your design? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a little bit of background. My art process is kind of um, like creating collage. I always have a lot of different ideas in my head and I try to combine them all together and make them cohesive. So my design here was a collage of the most striking and the most functional aspects of this year's historic collection. Um, so if you remember in the Navy Nurse Corps uniform, there were different aspects of it that you'll see here. One of them is the bellows pocket. Um, I am a big fan of anything that has pockets. I think that's something that needs to be incorporated a lot more in women's wear especially and I found it so functional and so elegant. Another thing is the gold crested buttons from the Navy Nurse Corps uniform. I felt like the gold crested buttons felt like a badge of honor to be a part of the Navy Nurse Corps and it was a key element of the uniform so I wanted to incorporate that as well. And as for the pleats and the skirt, that was entirely inspired by the ZLAC rowing uniform. And it was a little bit of a hidden detail, but in the cuff of the ZLAC uni rowing uniform, there are pleats. And I put pleats in the cuffs of my dress shirt, and I also wanted to really amplify that feature and make it a big statement part of my skirt as well. That's lovely. I love that you saw all of those little details and it just exploded into this beautiful idea. I know, I was so obsessed with every little thing. <laughs> it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it definitely worked. Okay, next question is for Ye Wan. Ye Wan, I know that you were inspired by the ZLAC rowing uniform, and I know that you also went out on your own and did some more research about the garment and its history. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what you discovered in your research and how it inspired your design? Yes. Uh, the original garment was made on worn in late century, and that time everyone does know that it was rare to women be too engaged in such activities like a sport. <laughs> but the direct rowing team did this, and after that, many women were able to do the same activity as them. So. I know that it's always hard to start as a first person to develop a new area, so I felt there are graders, and I that one that design was my favorite one is personally, so I choose it. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love that you use that reasoning and that it spoke to you personally as well. That's great. Uh, Ramses, you're next. Did you know immediately that you wanted to use the naval nurse uniform as your inspiration Did garment? Did you know immediately you wanted to use the naval nurse uniform as your inspiration garment? Did. Um, 
when we learned that the theme for this year's fashion reduce was uniforms, uh, my brain just started creating ideas, you know, right in the moment, concepts, thinking of fabric details and all of that. And I remember thinking, I hope that they show us a nursing home. Don't know why, but I, it, was, it would be really cool to interpret that into my own design aesthetic. Maybe they did show us the nurse uniform. So yes, right when I saw it, I knew that that garment would uh, be my main inspiration for mine to come to life. That's great. And then did you incorporate any uh, details from the nurse's uniform that you focused on more than anything else? More than anything else. Yes. Um, the front of my dress, the angle where the gathered skirt begins, is reference to where the jacket of the uniform ends and where we begin to see the skirt. You know, in the 40s, having an hourglass shape was the standard for women. And this thing that I wanted to incorporate in my garment as well because you can see how developed the jacket accentuates the figure. And I really like that. Uh, so the back of the dress, uh, the most apparent element is the collar. I created a flap that wraps the neckline and comes to collar in the back. And if you think about it, it makes sense that the collar would be on the back because that's where the closure is. And same as the shirt from the uniform, that's where you open and close it. So, yeah. Wonderful. Love your reasoning for that. Okay, Ellie, next question goes to you. Uh, so something that is probably not visible to our audience, but I know it's there because you and I talked a lot about it, is the interior of your garment. You spend a lot of time finishing that interior of your garment. Can you walk us through briefly what you did and how important that was to you to spend so much time on the interior? Uh, so, uh for the design for this dress, I thought, you know, it should be, since it's going to be so, um, so bold on the outside, I want it to be also bold on the inside. And I wanted to show uh, something beautiful besides just lining it. I wanted to do a Hong Kong finish, which is basically strips of bias fabric by one inch and just wrapping the seams around each of the seams so nothing's exposed. And the reasoning, I think, in my head, I was I was thinking this is gonna look great. Professor likes it. Everybody likes it. Awesome. Going into it, it was work. It was a lot of work, but I was so proud of it when it the way it turned out. I thought it was such a good color contrast from the neck to the inside of the dress. I think you should feel very proud. It's Thank really you. stunning, both inside and out. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go back to Melanie here. Uh, one of the unique things about your design is how you used asymmetry throughout the piece. Can you walk us through those particular elements and what led you to decide on that? Yes, um, so there's two parts to this answer. Um, the first part is I was really inspired by the Knights of Columbus jacket um, in the back there were these gorgeous coattails, they were overlapping, and not only did it inspire the angular trim on the dress, but it also inspired the overlapping layers of the skirt. Um, the second is that the asymmetry was a little bit of a street style flair that I wanted to add. I wanted to create a uniform that still felt like a uniform, but had a little bit more personality. Um, it was my way of kind of creating a more futuristic design and a futuristic take on uniforms that was more towards having the person wearing it feel like they can express themselves and feel confident in it and not feel like they were so uniform in an organization, if that makes sense. Definitely does. I love that. Thank you. Okay, Ramsey, it's back to you. Uh, the skirt element on your design was truly a labor of love. I know how much time you spent on it, but can you tell us a little bit about your construction process, such as how many yards of fabric went into your skirt? You know, how many iterations did you go through to find that perfect angle? Uh, sure. 
Um, we are talking about eight yards of bright white taffeta that wrinkles by just looking at it. <laughs> and that is four yards for the outer skirt and four yards for the lining. Um, so adding uh, that to the overall construction of this dress releases a lot of what it was between the manipulation of the fabric, making sure that it wouldn't wrinkle, keeping it clean, <laughs> sewing all the gathers and the linings to the dress by hand. It was just a challenge overall. And I know that it wouldn't be easy, but able to be able to sew a mock-up really helped me and guided me to making the right choices and avoiding mistakes. And I only did two versions of this skirt, which is the one from the mock-up and the final one. And like I said, sewing the mock-up was the way that I could troubleshoot and make sure that the final product would be how I wanted it to be. And I'm very content with all the work that went into the skirt and the dress as a whole. I think that it really paid off. And regardless of the outcome and before knowing the top four results, I was proud of my work then and I still am today. And you should be. And you should be wonderfully. <laughs> All right, Ellie, I'm coming back to you now. <laughs> Don't look surprised. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only designer here that chose not to use solid colored fabric. Can you talk about why you chose to use a bold houndstooth pattern with a dark red fabric for your contrast? So from the uniforms, uh, we, I, I was noticing black from the Knights of Columbus jacket and a hint of red on the crosses. And from the, the, I think the rowing uniform, it looked blue, but to me, I was thinking of a dark color. And I think I was trying to unify them all to be black and white since the Navy nurse was also white. Um, and I wanted to just have that uh, black and white with a little hint of color uh, for my design. And I wanted it to be bold. I definitely wanted the hounds to, uh, a hound's tooth or something with a pattern that would, you know, combine everything. Um, and that hound's tooth, the fabric is actually an outdoor fabric. So if she gets wet, it would just fall off of her since it's waterproof. Yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> Multifunctional. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so our next question is going to go to Ye Wan. Uh, Yewon, can you tell us um, what does the title of your garment mean and how did you come up with it? Uh, my title of the garment is Gold in the Dark Night. I mean, last, just last night that I saw the, my original garment at first time, I actually saw the NASA's Milky Way video from the YouTube. So <laughs> when I saw the First time it's an when I saw the J Black rolling uniform is the first time I thought it was like a Mercury in is I mean it I thought that it's similar to the Mercury so I chose the Gold in the Dark Knight as a title. Thank you. That's a wonderful reasoning. I love that. <laughs> All right, Melanie, I'm coming back to you now. So your garment has a very fantastical and almost cosplay feel to it, especially when we looked at your sketch. Can you talk about your other design influences that you used in addition to uniforms in creating your design and then how you use that to inform your design? Yeah, so I'd say my style is um, could be described as very whimsical and heavily influenced in Asian culture and fantasy. Um, starting with the collar of my dress shirt, I wanted it to be similar to the collar of a traditional Vietnamese aoyai, which you can kind of see what I'm wearing right now. I chose black and I feel like you can't really see it that well, but that's okay. Um, and with the dress, it's definitely more influenced by um, Asian school uniforms, including those that you see in a lot of prominent anime like Code Geass or Dolly and the Franks. And when I was creating this uniform, I just wanted a more futuristic out of this world kind of experience uniform. And I love how the uniforms in a lot of different shows and anime are, they're symbols of larger than life characters, which ties right back into my ideal of having a garment that makes you feel like you can express yourself and be inspired to do anything. So I was hoping to 
put it into a costume and have it be a uniform where anyone wearing it has the confidence to do what they want. Thank you, that's wonderful. Okay, Ellie, I'm coming back to you now. So your design went through a real journey and I know that you went through several modifications as far as structure and angle in order to achieve your desired silhouette. Um, can you talk briefly about the design and the mock-up process that you went through and then you know how you decided to alter your design along the way? Uh, so I wanted a really um, structured garment. Um, I took a lot of uh, uh, inspiration from the Knights of Columbus and I really wanted a, a silhouette that was to the waist, fitted to the waist, and I wanted to emphasize the waist and also uh, have really just a very stiff, uh, very uh, dramatic silhouette in a way. And it, we went through a lot, we went through a mock-up, a whole dress, and I had to add interfacing to both sides of of the peplum. I had to add interfacing to the skirt to keep the shape. I had to add interfacing double on the neck for a really stiff neck. So yeah, there was a lot of uh, interfacing in this. <laughs> oh, and interfacing on the sleeve cuffs. Yeah. I think there were fewer pieces that didn't have interfacing. Didn't yeah, <laughs> it should have just been all interface. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. It works though. You got the angle you wanted to. It worked really well. Yeah. Uh, Yay Juan, I have another question for you. Um, what is the gold trim made of on your garment? I know you went through different revisions going three bars, one bar, two bar, how many stripes you wanted. And then did you hand sew it on? Yeah, <laughs> I said hand sewing or the gold trim and that gold, tr gold trim is a design element. That one is, I mean, original gold, gold trim in the Direct rolling uniform, it just look like ribbon, like no ring or no any patterns of it. But I use um, I use the three thin strings art twist and create a patterns. So when I actually sewing it, that I felt that. It was too much when I used several lines of the trim, so I just choose to remove it. <laughs> well, I think it was a smart decision. It worked to your advantage. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I have one more question for you guys, and then I believe we're gonna turn it over to questions from our audience here. Uh, so the last question goes to Ramses. And Ramses, your garment is the most formal here. And it's the only one that goes below the knees, at least in the back. Can you talk about how you decided to have the ball gown and the marriage? Sure. Um, although my main inspiration is the uniform itself, uh, the 40s is a period of time that inspires me a lot regarding the fashions. You know, at the time, women's wear was very formal because it had masculine features and what men were in the 40s were suits. So for me, it was really just about putting pieces together. My inspirations, which were the formality of the time period and the uniform itself, and my design aesthetic, which is always about making a statement through shape, color, and volume. And that is how this dress came to be. Now for the thinking of the meaning and correlation between evening wear and formality. formality is what spread into both of them. And formality doesn't have to be literal because clothes do carry a message, but it is up to us who wear the clothes to forward and communicate that message. So these garments are an extension of us. So tonight I'm communicating and presenting myself through this dress. Thank you. Thank you, Ramses. I love that. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sheila, and we are going to, I believe, start taking questions from the audience. All right. Thank you so much. There is so much information, um, and all of you are just such beautiful 
um, people on the inside. And that really shows through in your work. And I am totally inspired and gosh, I'm getting teary eyed just thinking about how inspirational you, all of you um, are in these creations. Um, we have lots and lots of questions. So I'm gonna try and get, the, get through these uh, as many as possible. And then if we don't get through all of these before the end, uh, I'll leave my email address and actually you'll probably get an email from me uh, tomorrow. And please feel free to send your questions to me and I'll get them to the designers and we'll get your questions answered, okay? So we're going to go first, let's see. Um, some of the questions have already been answered. Um, here's a question from Patty. She's asking what pop culture influences, if at all, inspired your designs? And let's just go to um, Ellie. Uh, for this specific dress or in general? For, for this dress, I thought, I really wanted a bold statement. I really wanted a current statement and I really wanted an eye-catching statement. Definitely um, pop culture and the celebrity scene. I think somebody who has the eye for the drama of a hound's tooth dress definitely would wear this. That's what I think the more of the current trends I would go for. Great. Does anybody else want to jump in there with that question? If there was a pop culture influence on any of your designs? Yeah. Um, so before I was talking about street style and the street style flair that I wanted to add to my uniform, um, I want to say that the skirt was very influenced by a lot of K-pop stars and a lot of K-pop uniforms and outfits. Um, there's one brand called Lychee the Label that has a lot of Asian streetwear and I'm just obsessed with it. And they also do a similar asymmetrical skirt. So that was a big influence for me too. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, this question is, let's see, there's actually lots of really great comments. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read them all because I believe all of you have access to see those in the chat. Um, let's see. It looks like, Yewan, you answered, what is the gold trim made of? Did we answer that question already? Yeah, I think okay. so. <laughs> it was three, Ryan. Three thin lines are make create a pattern as a day twist. I can show it for you now if I just if you just give a second. Here I have a bunch of this, so it looks like this. Can you see that? Yeah, three lines are twisted and make a create and make and create a pattern. So this one is the reason why I just chose to remove some gold trim from the original. Great, thank you. And uh, Ramses, we have a question asking, what is the material you use? I believe we touched on that, but maybe just let us know. It's a uh, white stuff of satin. Okay. Did you, I? I think I heard taffeta. Yes, that's white taffeta. Great. Thank you. This is another. Here's another question uh, from Helen. Thank you for sharing your work. Are there any plans to submit your designs to the ITAA design competition or present at the Costume Society of America? Will you tell us more about those things? I definitely don't have that information. Jordan, perhaps you do. I'm sure. She yes, I can definitely that. hook you guys up with that information. And the answer all of you should have to that question is yes. yes, yes. <laughs> I also wanted to remind everybody to go ahead right now and go to the polling button at the bottom of your screen. Just click on that and go ahead and vote for um, your favorite design. Um, and designer, and we'll be getting to that in just a few moments. Just scrolling through to see if we have, let's see. Um, Tina Valencia is asking, how long have you been in the design program? That's to all panelists. Um, Jordan, typically how long is the program? And um, do you wanna kind of touch on that? Sure, um, our program is designed that it's a two-year program, but obviously that 
depends a lot on what else the student has going on at the time. That's for full time. So a lot of our students work full time. So they come to school part time. They have families outside. So it can take a little bit longer, but it is designed to be a two year program. Great, thank you. And then uh, one last question for Melanie. Melanie, did you make the pleats? That's coming from Geneva. Or yes. Jennifer. Yes, yeah. I did. Um, girl, I know you have made pleats before. <laughs> um, I did make the pleats. I had to measure out every, I think I did inch and then inch and a half. And it's really satisfying doing it. Um, you measure it out and then you, line every all of your plates up and you iron it down and let it just press in place and when you run your fingers through completed plates it's the most satisfying thing ever sheila we do have a request if it's okay to share an image of all the garments again real yes. quick i'm actually gonna do that right now i'm gonna put um a photo up of all four of the garments together, if that's okay. And uh, Jordan, if you wanna just go through each one and um, state the name of the designer, just to make sure that I don't get them scrambled up. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the first one on the left uh, with the dark navy with the gold trim, that is Ye Wan Shin. The second one with the red dress and the white blouse underneath, that is Melanie Nyo. The third one, which is that white taffeta ball gown, that is Ramsey's Alfaro. And then the fourth one with the hound's tooth coat dress, that is Ellie Andrade. All right, I'll just give you a few more moments to go ahead and place your votes. In the meantime, um, I want to announce that we will be, the all four of these fabulous designers this year will be getting a one-year membership to the San Diego History Center um, so that you can bring all of your friends and family to come and enjoy the garments and seeing your um, creation in a museum. That is so exciting. And we will also be giving you a gift card to Sewing Machines Plus. So um, congratulations to all four of these finalists. I'm sure there were lots of fabulous designs. These were the top four um, of all the designs that were chosen. And we will be giving an extra, um, for the People's Choice Award, you will be getting an eight by 10 printout of your design from the fashion shoot from the San Diego History Center, additional. So without any further ado, Jordan, go ahead and um, go uh, with the four category winners. Okay, wonderful. All right, guys. So I am so proud of all of you. You did amazing work that turned out so beautiful, just simply stunning. Um, so without any further ado, for best translation of historic garment, this award went to Yewan Shin. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for most innovative garment. This award went to Melanie No. For most wearable garment, this one went to Ellie Andrade. <laughs> All right, and then we have most transformative design, and this one went to Ramsey's Alfaro. Congratulations to all of you. You should feel very proud. All right, I am going to um, announce the winner of the People's Choice Award. Give me a moment so I can get the photo ready. Of course, as always, um, the votes run so close together. I remember last year we almost, we either had a tie or almost had a tie. Um, of a couple of the garments. So it's such a hard decision, right? You can always, you can see yourself wearing these designs and, um, or you can see somebody you know and loves wearing these designs. Um, so whatever the case may be for your votes, let me, give me a few seconds here. And 
The winner of the People's Choice Award is Melanie. Congratulations, Melanie. Thank you so much. I Can I just thank Jordan really quickly for guiding us through this entire class during one of the hardest years? Um, it was such, it was a great class. I, I wanted to take it for so long and I'm so glad that we had you, Jordan, throughout that entire semester. And thank you, Sheila and Leilani too, for this entire collaboration. This was such a dream come true. Oh, you're welcome. So glad we could be a part of it with you. Um, I do want to once again, thank all of our guests and our members of the San Diego History Center, of course, for always supporting us. We are a nonprofit organization and we could not survive without your support and your donations. Um, just quickly, we can um, you, you can support the museum by becoming a member. You can make a donation on our website, San Diego History Center.org, or you can text SD History to 44321. Um, and you can give that way through uh, your text messaging. So once again, I just want to thank everybody before we hop off of here. Just a few um, last remarks from one from each of the designers. I'd like to ask each one of you, um, what's next for you, and where do you go? Where do you where do you want to go from here? What's the next step in in your journey? So let's start with Ramses. Well, for me, I I'm just really looking forward to finish the program, and I'm just not sure because every time that I think of something that I want to do, then I change my mind. I'm, I don't know I'm like that, but I'm really looking forward to staying in the fashion world. And that's what's up for me. All right. Thank you, Ramses. Great job on your design. Let's go to Ye Wan. Uh, I'm not sure either. <laughs> But I'm sure that I will stay on the fashion design things. I mean, as a job or as a hobby, I will keep making some garments and post from post to my Instagram and some other social media. So if I see, if you guys see my post somewhere, then just thank you for about it. <laughs> Thank you, Yewan. All right, Ellie, we're moving to you. What's next for you? What's what's the next in your journey? Definitely keep making clothes. Um, definitely uh, get all my garments out there, sell, uh, not sell, show. Um, I definitely want to keep going on this trajectory, I think, with collections class. And hopefully that gets me another, pay, you know, another step into the right direction of becoming a really good designer and someone who actually sells and have, you know, people wear my clothes. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. All right, and last but not least, our People's Choice Award winner, Melanie, what's next? Um, I definitely want to start learning how to mix my illustrations with my designs. And I want to start painting on textiles and play with, play with textile design a little bit more. Um, I have a little, I have a portfolio um, called Annie Quinn Designs. So I've been doing a lot of drawings, but the next step is definitely combining those two things and playing with paints and different materials and seeing where that goes. Fantastic. Well, we can't wait to see what's next for all of you and what's coming um, in your journey. I'd like to thank Jordan. I'd like to thank all of the designers and of course our fabulous Leilani and Jeremy, our collection specialists at the San Diego History Center. And I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us tonight um, for another year of our fabulous fashion redux. And I hope to see you at the History Center soon. Good night, everybody.